Hello and welcome to the Paragon of Play podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Spice. Today we are going to discuss aces, and not the kind that you get in a deck of cards. We're talking about adverse childhood experiences, what they are, how they can be prevented, and why we as educators need to be well-versed on their impact. So what are ACEs? ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. These are traumatic and stressful events which occur in the life of a child before the age of 18. ACEs have been demonstrated to have a negative impact on the physical and mental health of adults who experienced ACEs and even reduces life expectancy. The concept of ACEs comes from a mid-90s study examining the relationship between childhood abuse and dysfunction and public health outcomes in adulthood. The study was conducted via a partnership between Kaiser Permanente, a medical consortium in the United States, and the CDC, or Center for Disease Control, in the United States. The first of the two waves in the study included survey responses from over 9,000 adults using a questionnaire about adverse childhood experiences. So we're actually going to pause for a moment, and just so we have a frame of reference, uh, we're going to take the ACEs test ourselves. That way we can understand what exactly is being assessed. There are 10 questions, so you can keep track of your score either on your hand or you could write down tally marks. Now, there is a trigger warning in the description box, but I will just add it in here as well. The following content, and honestly, the rest of the podcast, uh, is going to contain and touch on sensitive topics, so you do have to make the decision for yourself if you wish to go forward. All right, we're going to go ahead and start with the test, so get a pen ready or get your fingers ready to track, so each question is just yes or no. Uh, For each yes, you get a point. Question one. Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you feel that you might be physically hurt? Question two. Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Question three. Did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or touch your body in an inappropriate way, attempt or actually have some sort of intercourse with you? Question four. Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other or support each other? Question five, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, or had no one to protect you, or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it? Question six, were your parents ever separated or divorced? Question seven, Was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her? Or sometimes, often, or very often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard? Or ever repeatedly hit at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or knife? Question eight. Did you live with anyone who had a who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs. Question nine, was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt to take their own life? Question 10, did a household member go to prison? All right, so now you're going to add up uh, the total number of points you got and this is going to be your ACEs score. So if you have one or more ACEs, this is completely normal, especially considering the fact that one of the questions is if you have a parent that is separated or divorced. So depending on the area being surveyed, generally about 50% to two thirds of a given population in Canada or the US will have at least one ACE, with about 20% of a population having three or more ACEs. 
So information in the U.S. is a little bit different because we have not, or sorry, we have not had a national Canadian survey reporting ACEs. So we actually don't have um, sort of a succinct body of information regarding these statistics. So we do go off of information gathered by various groups and organizations uh, that gather and then report health data across Canada. So as you gathered from taking the ACE test, ACEs are experiences which are traumatic and distressing. And these events create toxic stress in the life of a child. So some stress in childhood is normal. Sometimes we have to take a difficult test. We might get frustrated when learning a new skill such as riding a bike. Maybe you have to move to a new town and away from all of your friends. Perhaps you experienced the death of a grandparent or a pet and maybe you sustained an injury such as a broken bone while playing. These experiences can cause short-term stress, but with the support of the adults around us, we can overcome these stressful events and develop resilience. The adults in our lives co-regulate with us and they show us how to overcome these difficult experiences. Although moving to a new town or experiencing the death of a beloved pet can be frightening, your overall sense of safety is never impacted. The adults, resources, and supports in place help us to overcome negative experiences. As children experiencing small amounts of normal stress, it affects our, the way that our brain develops. Neural connections are made and the brain learns that sometimes life is hard, but I have supports in place and I can get through it. This is in contrast to adverse childhood experiences, which include childhood abuse and neglect. Adults, resources, and supports may not have necessarily been in place or available to support us in overcoming the adverse experience. ACEs can cause prolonged states of stress in a child. High states of stress cause the release of cortisol in the body, which is also known as the fight or flight hormone. Now, small amounts of cortisol here and there totally normal. The fight or flight hormone helps to keep us safe when we're in danger. But when the body is constantly or frequently flooded with cortisol, the brain cannot do the work it normally would in developing the neural pathways that build a healthy brain and mind. Instead, the brain is learning that the world is an unsafe place where survival is your main priority. As you can clearly tell, neurological development is impacted severely by ACEs. So what are the other effects of ACEs, especially into adulthood? Adverse childhood experiences have been linked to mental health problems, infectious diseases, and chronic diseases. Adults with higher ACE scores are more likely to suffer from depression, COPD, asthma, kidney disease, stroke, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and obesity. They are more likely to smoke and drink, be unemployed, and drop out of high school. Keep in mind as well that there is a dose-response effect happening here. The more ACEs you have, the greater likelihood that these medical concerns will be present in your life. In fact, people with six or more ACEs will on average lose 20 years, 20 years off of their lifespan. That's a pretty significant amount. Clearly, ACEs pose a threat to communities and society. Parents with high ACE scores are more likely to raise children with high ACE scores. Health conditions which can be linked to ACEs pose a burden on the healthcare system and underfunded mental health care resources simply cannot keep up with demand. Politics and social norms impact the availability of services and resources that can help families to prevent and treat the effects of ACEs. When political policies remove or repress services 
that are important to communities such as sexual health clinics, abuse persons shelters, parenting resources, mental health services, and abuse prevention education, communities can see a greater impact from ACEs. As well, when norms such as abuse toward intimate partners or the sexualization of children are upheld in a family or community, sufferers of abuse and those around them are less likely to believe that they can or should access resources and support. So can ACEs be prevented? This all sounds terrible. Adverse childhood experiences often plague generations within families, and they have been demonstrated to cause very poor health outcomes. However, ACEs can be prevented. Parenting resources and programs can help mothers, fathers, and caregivers to develop the skills needed in order to support the optimal development of their children. This could include prenatal courses, infant feeding and development programs, mommy and me or daddy and me classes, children's playgroups, and parenting classes for parents of teens. High quality child care can also help families, empowering parents to go to work and to have the access to the support of well-trained early childhood educators. When parents work in places that offer, offer flexible working hours, living wages, and paid sick leave, they are empowered to continue to work and to be able to afford the necessities such as food, shelter, and appropriate clothing for the weather. Earning a living wage can reduce stress on parents, affording them the mental space to meet the social and emotional needs of their children. Living wages can also prevent the need to work multiple jobs or to obtain income through other means, affording parents the ability to spend more time parenting their children. Access to health and social care services such as mental health supports, addictions counseling, family and child counseling, abused persons resources, and sexual health clinics can both prevent ACEs from occurring, and when ACEs do occur, the victim can be supported adequately, thus reducing the length of time in which toxic stress is experienced. As mentioned earlier, resources and supports are impacted either positively or negatively by politics and social norms. We need to start having conversations about ACEs, informing the public and our peers, training professionals who work in public service, and demanding that political parties represent the needs and realities of the public. This is also where education workers come in. Children who have experienced ACEs may represent as having behavioral, cognitive, and social difficulties. The toxic levels of stress experienced by children affects how their brains are developed, and has diminished their feelings of safety, autonomy, and social connectedness. Consider this scenario. You have an interesting and engaging engineering experience available to your students today. Perhaps it's a drawstring bridge made from recycled materials. Having to problem solve, organize your thinking, communicate effectively with peers, and utilize working memory throughout this involved task provides a healthy and developmentally appropriate level of stress on children, stress that helps the brain grow in a good way. It is a level and type of stress that supports neurological and social emotional growth. However, if there is a child who consistently experiences high levels of toxic stress in their life, they might in initially enjoy the activity, but perhaps when the level of healthy stress becomes too great for them, since their mind and body are already burdened by toxic stress, they may become frustrated and angry with the activity, potentially breaking their bridge or behaving in a dangerous manner. They came in with a nearly full cup, and it is very easily overfilled. How many times has this happened in your practice? A child is playing or engaging willingly in an experience and suddenly seeming out of nowhere, they've become enraged, throwing, kicking, screaming, stomping. As educators, we can ensure that we are designing and implementing programs that are developmentally appropriate, play-based, child-centered and research supported, but we have to make certain that our program is also trauma-informed. This is 
the part of the puzzle where we treat ACEs in our practice as educators. Now, please keep in mind that ACEs, um, as its own standalone concept, does not cover all forms of trauma that children can experience, not in the slightest. Poverty, community violence, systemic racism, history of colonialism, sexism, and more all impact child development and impose high levels of toxic stress on children and their families. ACEs simply provides a snapshot and a framework to begin to understand the impact of experiences of a child's upbringing and does not represent the whole picture. Educators need to be aware of and trained to understand the various forms of trauma that a child can experience. This is, of course, why there needs to be greater emphasis on LGBT plus anti-racist and truth and re reconciliation education worker training and professional develop opportunities. So this is where trauma-informed practice comes in. Trauma-informed practice in education is rooted in the principles of safety, trustworthiness, support, empowerment, voice, choice, and consideration and respect for all forms of trauma. Trauma-informed educators understand the importance of putting relationships first in the classroom and choose to reframe problem behaviors as behaviors that occur when children have problems. Trauma-informed educators are able to implement strategies and practices that empower them to support all students, including those who have experienced abuse and dysfunction. It involves an understanding of co-regulation and how co-regulation can help to support the development of self-regulation. I want to pause for a moment here. I'm going uh, kind of to the side for a second. We hear lots and lots about self-regulation. It's in some of our program documents. Um, we include it on our websites when we advertise our programs. We're big into self-regulation. We have to remember the co-regulation piece. Young children whose brains are not yet fully developed need the support of an adult to help them to regulate themselves. They need this support consistently before they are able to develop the skill of self-regulation. Think about when a baby is crying. We are co-regulating with that baby when we come to the baby and pick it up when it's crying and choose a way to soothe it. You can contrast this with a baby who perhaps is in a home or in an environment where the adults present are not physically or mentally or in some other form capable of addressing the needs of the baby. No one is co-regulating the baby. The baby is crying and there's no response. If co-regulation does not take place first, self-regulation simply cannot develop and it cannot develop appropriately. So back on track, the impact of ACEs can be mitigated through the supports a child has in their environment. That's where we come in as educators. The biggest source of support that can be available to a child outside of the home is school or child care. As educators, it is our duty to consider every child that comes into our care and to be aware of their unique needs and challenges. Unfortunately, sometimes I do hear educators saying things like, well, I'm not a counselor and I don't get paid to do that. And we aren't counselors, and we shouldn't pretend that we are. But the reality is, our job is to educate, to support, and to care for children. And therefore, it is our duty to understand ACEs and to be trauma-informed. Understanding ACEs and finding training on trauma-informed practice is one way that educators can empower themselves to create learning environments which truly welcome all students. Now, I won't be deep diving into trauma-informed practice today because that's another episode for another day. 
but I hope that you can take time to begin to consider how understanding ACEs and looking into trauma-informed practice can improve how you teach or care for children, how you manage your programming, and your interactions with children and families. Educators and learning environments can serve as a means to uplift and support students and children who have experienced ACEs, and it all begins with knowledge. Thank you for tuning in today. Let me know in the comments section down below, did you already know about ACEs? Did you receive any pre-service educator training about ACEs, or is this a new topic for you? I can't wait to hear your ideas. If you're interested in early and primary tips, research, and tutorials, please like this video and subscribe to my channel for new content every week. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. Please find in the description box below some links and more information about this topic. See you later.